Dobry den, and welcome to our virtual <clears throat> and live audience uh, from Prague, the American Center. I'm happy to introduce and start off Central Europe Week from the Atlantic Council. This is a week of public programming, meetings, and discussions about the U.S.-Central European relationship and its significance today. We've invested, we, the Atlantic Council, have invested a lot in Central Europe over the years because this is a crucial place where history has been made. The Czechs, Poles, Baltics, and others worked with the United States before and after the fall of communism in Europe, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, to help build a reality of Europe whole, free, and at peace. Nobody knows better than the Czechs the price of dictators running around Europe making war. And nobody knows better than the Czechs the opportunities that a generation of peace has given the people of Czechia to build a great nation again, prosperous, secure, and in the heart of Europe. This is an achievement that is still underway. The theme today is securing Ukraine's European future. And, it, and I put it to everyone that Ukraine's struggle for a European future against the Kremlin's aggression is part of the same struggle that the Czechs were in during the Velvet Revolution. It is part of the same struggle. Ukraine wants to join Europe for the same reason that the Czechs and the Poles wanted to join Europe. It's a civilizational choice. NATO, the European Union, are the institutions of the West, of the transatlantic community and of Europe. But the goal of a united Europe, bringing together free democratic republics and kingdoms, all democracies, is a great achievement and a worthy cause that the United States has supported from the beginning. My thanks to the U.S. Embassy and to Europeum for their support. And my thanks especially to Ambassador Sabat, who's here with us today, who has helped the Atlantic Council and who believes in this cause, which is a deep American cause, held by Republicans and Democrats from Truman to Reagan uh, and all the presidents and all the presidents since. So um, we've got a panel discussion, later discussions, but you've heard enough from me. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Ambassador Sabat. Ambassador Freed, thank you for your welcome remarks. And ladies and gentlemen, let me please welcome you today, both in person and virtually, to the American Center in Prague. My team at the embassy is privileged to have such a fantastic public space right next door to the embassy and just down the road from Prague Castle and the Foreign Ministry. I commend the Atlantic Council for selecting such a timely and relevant theme for this year's Central Europe Week, leadership and resilience on Europe's front lines. In my role as ambassador, I want to spend a few minutes focusing on this theme through the lens of the U.S.-Czech relationship. As many of you know, next year marks a significant milestone in transatlanticism. NATO will turn 75 years old. Simultaneously, these countries that joined in the first wave of post-Soviet NATO expansion, including the Czech Republic, next year will mark 25 years in NATO. The Czech Republic joining NATO was a significant step in our ever-deepening U.S.-Czech relationship. Just two years after joining, the Czech Republic, along with all other NATO states, invoked Article 5 for the first time in history in response to the 9-11 attacks in New York City, Pennsylvania, and Washington, D.C. U.S. and Czech troops served side-by-side -side in Afghanistan and in Iraq. 
And today, we are united in our support for Ukraine in response to Russia's war of aggression and in support for Israel in response to the devastating attacks by Hamas. Just this past year, the United States and the Czech Republic finalized our bilateral defense cooperation agreement. This agreement now serves as the foundation of our bilateral security partnership. It not only allows and enables our militaries to more easily train and exercise together, do exercises together, but more importantly, to work together to secure and protect NATO's eastern flank. Back in August, I was at Nami Est Air Base for the official unveiling of the Czech Republic's newly purchased U.S. Bell, Viper, and Venom helicopters, a significant capability enhancement for the Czech Air Force and an important component of the U.S.-Czech partnership in the Czech Armed Forces modernization agenda. It was extremely powerful and a deeply symbolic moment. Watching the historic Soviet helicopters depart the Czech Air Force while the new U.S. Vipers flew in. It was additionally powerful knowing that these retired helicopters will have an important future, helping brave Ukrainians fight for their future. One of Putin's main goals in his war of aggression in Ukraine was to fracture NATO's unity and weaken the transatlantic alliance. And he failed resoundingly at this effort. The irony of this is not lost on me as I look around and see a NATO stronger than before, especially here in the Czech Republic. Putin's war has instead strengthened our transatlantic resolve and unity. Our countries are connected by shared values and aspirations. It is not simply a relationship of convenience or necessity, but an alliance of two democracies wholly committed to freedom, justice, and equality. During my first year as ambassador, I have witnessed Czech leadership ensuring Ukraine gets the needed equipment, training, and support to push back Russia's invasion. And two weeks ago, I had the privilege of meeting a group of Ukrainian soldiers that are receiving training here in the Czech Republic. These women and men are training not only to defend their homeland, but to drive out an invading force, a force that is occupying their homes, abducting their children, murdering their citizens, and questioning their right to a Ukrainian identity. Meeting these brave soldiers and the professional group of Czech trainers was a profoundly moving experience. I was proud not only of my government to support Ukraine, but I had the privilege to be here in the Czech Republic, working side by side with a country equally committed to supporting Ukraine and pushing back against the Kremlin's aggression. The Czech Republic has welcomed over half a million Ukrainian refugees forced from their home by Putin's imperialist delusions. And the Czech Republic has provided safe haven so that these Ukrainians here can find jobs, homes, and peace. The Czech Republic has also provided a half a billion dollars worth of military equipment and training to the Ukrainian military. And the Czech Republic continues to be on the diplomatic front lines advocating for a stronger global pushback against Russia's expansionist agenda. So, Ambassador Freed, when you refer to leadership on Europe's front lines, know that I am humbled to spend my working days here in Prague with President Pavel, Prime Minister Fiala, Foreign Minister Lepovsky, Defense Minister Chernikova, and others who exemplify the Czech Republic's outstanding leadership in this critical time. Thank you all. Welcome, everyone. Is this mic on? All right. Welcome, everyone, as the Atlantic Council kicks off our Central Europe Week. 
we have a all-star panel today who, who are going to talk about a view from Prague on securing Ukraine's European future. Amid Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, several Central European countries, such as Czechia and Poland, have really stepped up to lead transatlantic partner support for Ukraine. This, is, this includes financing, military aid, uh, and housing the most refugees per capita, as um, uh, the U.S. ambassador to Czechia just mentioned in his opening remarks. Uh, many Central European leaders have also advocated for Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic future through European Union accession and NATO accession. This conversation, uh, we want to take about an hour to explore what this looks like, what next steps can be taken to bolster Ukraine's position in this regard within the transatlantic community, um, and how transatlantic partners can also build on Central Europe's experience to assist Ukraine as it looks to strengthen its European future. So with that, I'd like to take a few minutes to welcome our panel. Uh, to my immediate right, we have Ambassador Daniel Freed, who is the Weiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, then we have His Excellency Jan Marion, who is Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs here in Czechia. Uh, we have Dr. Benedetta Berti, who is the Head of Policy Planning in the Office of the Secretary General of NATO. Uh, and finally, uh, last but not least, of course, we have Ambassador Ole Shamsher, who is the former Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States uh, and also a Distinguished Fellow at the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. So welcome to all of you, and thank you for taking time to be with us today. Um, Ambassador Shamsher, I think I'd like to start with you to sort of frame the conversation a little bit. You are based in Kyiv. You have a, a sense of what is happening on the ground, um, the heartbeat of, of Ukraine and Kyiv at the moment, um, the conversations that are happening in terms of Ukraine's European future. What does that look like uh, from, from where you're sitting? How are, is Ukraine thinking about its European future and why is that future so important to the Ukrainian people? Thank you, I hope that works. Uh, well, actually, uh, at the devotion level, of course, uh, maybe the best, uh, the best and the, uh, the most concrete and exact uh, um, thing that I am bringing back to Kyiv, that the resilience of the Ukrainian people, the sense of never giving up and continue our struggle. Because for us, this, this war is uh, actually maybe the final act of our struggle for independence and real sovereignty. I think that in 2014, during uh, the revolution of dignity and uh, the start of the struggle of the Ukrainian people against uh, Russian aggression, uh, we uh, passed the point of no return in terms of uh, choosing the uh, uh, model of development for Ukraine by rejecting neo-Soviet uh, authoritarian uh, Putinist model in favor of the Western model based on uh, shared democratic values. And uh, during this big war, as we call it, uh, this choice has been only reinforced. And definitely uh, now we have, I think, a very important confluence of two trends. Firstly, the uh, I would say uh, wish of the Ukrainian people, which has never been expressed so strongly to be a part of the community of democratic nations and also finally the um, understanding on the part of our partners that Ukraine is actually is not a problem. It's the uh, solution for many problems and first of all it can contribute so importantly into the security of Europe, into the security of the transatlantic space. And that's why we are moving uh, ahead, but we are definitely would like to be a part of the uh, transatlantic community, a part of the European Union community. So the overwhelming support on the part of the population, and uh, as far as uh, this is concerned, I think that uh, in terms of uh, the uh, NATO membership, with all due respect, I think uh, that Vilnius was actually 
uh, a huge disappointment for Ukrainians, but it also was a faux pas for, uh, for, for NATO itself, and we do hope that uh, during the uh, summit in the Washington next year, there would be a possibility to put Ukraine really on track to uh, membership in uh, NATO. So we understand that uh, full membership is after the war, but we should be having this, as we call it, roadmap at least, it, uh, Ukraine should be really on track. As far as EU membership uh, is concerned, we uh, are very glad that we received this candidate country status. We understand that a lot is to be done by Ukraine, but uh, are, we also sense the change of uh, the attitude on the part of the European Union. Rather than explaining why Ukraine cannot be the member, now we have the desire to uh, integrate Ukraine into the um, European Union. And in this sense, uh, the visit of uh, Madam von der Leyen was very important. We do hope that there would be a decision in a couple of days of uh, starting the negotiations uh, with Ukraine and uh, definitely that's something that uh, motivates us. So, uh, I would say uh, maybe drawing conclusion, we really uh, understand that now there is a, a window of opportunity, but uh, also the window of necessity for, uh, for Ukraine and uh, for our democratic partners, and we should do really uh, move forward. As far as Ukrainians are concerned, we never give up. We uh, are ready to work as and do as much as should be done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I realized when I did my uh, opening remarks, I forgot to mention, for those uh, who are t tuning in online, just go to askac.org and you'll see our event listed there and you can submit questions there. Um, so please, as you're watching this panel online, think of questions and send them to me. Uh, I'll be able to see them here on my phone as they come through and I'll be sure to get to audience questions that way. So just, we'll get that out of the way and we continue the panel. Um, Mr. Marion, I'd like to ask you, um, from, from, your point of view, the U U.S. ambassador in his opening remarks highlighted just how supportive uh, Czechia has been for Ukraine over the last couple of years. 500,000 Ukrainian refugees, um, helping them find jobs, uh, half a billion dollars of support for military equipment and training, and also one of the countries in Central Europe uh, advocating for the strongest pushback uh, against Russia's full-scale invasion. From your point of view, do you see that support being able to continue here in, in Prague? And what do you see as Ukraine's outlook for its future in the, the European Union and the European community more generally? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for having this in Prague. I think it's vital to talk to each other between the region of Central Europe and the US first. Uh, the support of Czechia and the Czech people and the Czech government remains strong and we will continue and keep as long as necessary because this is not only about the moral reason or moral motivation, but this is about our security. This is also about the understanding how important Ukraine is and our previous policy, for instance, the Eastern Partnership was very much about EU offering advice to Ukraine, Moldova and others. Now we see that we can and have learned from you in terms of resilience, defense, cyber and others. And Ukraine can greatly contribute to the future enlarged EU. Of course, as to this, we need to manage expectations because now we heard, for instance, about 2030 as one of the possible deadlines. Uh, this is too late for many and too early for many. So this will, meet, this will not be that easy. But I think we need to make sure that we do as much as possible together with Ukraine and Moldova to help within the, for instance, internal market, roaming, infrastructure, education, scientific cooperation, so that then the membership wouldn't make that much of a difference because the EU, Ukraine would be already linked with EU. At the same time, we also need to continue with the internal EU debate about the necessary reforms because some member states argue that uh, this has to happen before the enlargement. And uh, as to the support of Czech society, I think it's still, still here. We will do as much as possible. And also, I think we have learned a lot since Vrbětice explosion, for instance, about Russian meddling in this region, but not only we had Salisbury and other cases. So I think now the understanding of Russia 
in the EU and among allies in NATO and others is totally different and the level of unity is still very good. And I must say, unfortunately, Putin has been helping us with all the atrocities to make sure that, the, that at the cost of Ukrainian lives. So we, 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 we always learn something new and we, we, we understand how important it is to do the homeworks, be it number of Russian diplomats, be it other issues related to resilience, be it energy independence. And I think maybe some in the EU used to be more naive or easygoing as to Russia. Now the situation has totally changed. Thank you. Ambassador Fried, I'd like you to sort of pick up on that. Uh, this panel is great because we have a U.S. perspective, a Czech perspective, a NATO perspective, and a Ukrainian perspective. So we get the full, the, the uh, whole nine yards in, in terms of where different countries are in terms of Ukraine's European future. Can you give us the United States perspective here? There's been an intense debate happening, uh, especially between the Republic Democratic and Republican parties about uh, funding continued support for Ukraine, both militarily, economically. Um, it seems like bipartisan support is continuing to hold, uh, but the conversation seems to be more in the forefront of people's minds now, especially as we head into 2024. Why is it so important to ensure that bipartisan support for Ukraine continues, and do you see that holding in the United States? That's a big, tough question. And you're the perfect person to answer it. <laughs> the, the internationalist consensus in the United States has been strong ever since the late 1940s. And it involved, on the Democrats, Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, and on the Republicans, Eisenhower, who consolidated American Cold War strategy, and Ronald Reagan. That tradition was built on the ruins of so-called America First isolationism, which took America out of European security, which resulted in disaster. Millions and millions and millions of people died because the Americans didn't step up when we, when we could have and should have. Now that battle is being resumed. When I was young, the voices against America's leadership in the world came from the left, angry over the Vietnam War. Now they're coming mostly from the right in a rebooted America First movement, the same movement that brought strategic disaster to the world. That's what this is about. The Congress, if it could have a straight vote, would probably vote. All right. If the Congress could vote straight, it would probably vote for aid to Ukraine and to Israel. But it's being caught up in our politics. And I say that without particular pride or pleasure. President Biden in his Oval Office speech was drawing on the traditions of Truman, Kennedy, and Reagan when he linked the fights that Israel and Ukraine are having. Now, there are lots of reasons why it's not a perfect analogy, but it is true that the authoritarian powers are working together to tear down what what policy wonks call the rules-based international order and what we used to call the free world. The democratic world system that the United States helped set up after 1945. That's what this is about. And the Ukrainians, as Ambassador Shumsher said, want to join the system. They looked at the alternatives. They looked at Russia and they looked at Czechia and Poland. And what they saw in Czechia and Poland is that a generation of freedom brought massive prosperity to these countries. Some of the best decades in their history. And they want some of that. They want that security. They want that prosperity. They want Europe. That's why they were flying, the Ukrainians were flying the EU flag in the Maidan in 2014. And we have a responsibility to help the Ukrainians, but there is a big debate. Uh, Americans are 
it is said, and with some truth, weary after the long Iraq and Afghan wars. Just as Americans in the 1930s were disenchanted by the results of World War I. That's no excuse for isolationism, but we have to understand its roots. And this is a struggle that's going on right now and will be part of both uh, next year's presidential campaign in the United States and a fight within the Republican Party between the Trumpite and the Reaganite wings. So that's my best at a very tough and unfortunately relevant question. You also mentioned that um, the Ukrainians want Europe. They also want NATO. Um, and so this was a major topic of conversation in the lead up to the Vilnius summit this year. Uh, the goal, of course, I think for people that watch this space closely, was to avoid a 2008 scenario where NATO uh, promised that Ukraine and Georgia would eventually join the alliance but really gave no timeline as to how that might happen, when that might happen, which it could be argued just sort of invites Russian aggression, and it did. We saw the two August uh, invasion uh, of Georgia in 2008, 2014 Crimea, 2022. Um, Russia's full-scale invasion. Um, Dr. Berti, from, from your point of view at NATO, um, where is this debate uh, sitting at the moment, and how are you thinking about Ukraine's NATO future? Another easy, easy question. Another easy question, but I think Ambassador Fried framed the why this is such an important question for the future of the transatlantic alliance and the future of NATO itself, right? Because, and I think that's important before going into the how NATO is providing practical and political support to Ukraine. I think it's important that we always start with the why, and I think that's a very deeply entrenched view within the alliance that what the future of Ukraine and its future as a sovereign independent country is absolutely essential for the future security and peace of the Euro-Atlantic area at large. So the stakes are extremely high. It's not just about supporting a country which is fighting for its own existence. It's also about standing up for the rules-based international order, as Ambassador Fried said, but it's also about what type of deterrent signaling are we sending to assertive authoritarian actors in the Euro-Atlantic area and beyond. For example, what is Beijing learning from uh, the transatlantic communities unity and resolve in supporting Ukraine. I think that's a very important signal. So I think we start from, from the NATO perspective, it's always important that we start with why this is not a marginal question, but a, an essential one for the future of transatlantic security and for the future of NATO as well. Uh, with that in mind, uh, and I, I know the Vilnius summit was already mentioned, maybe I'll just say how I think the Vilnius summit did push us in the right direction that we can talk about what needs to come next. Uh, first of all, I think the Vilnius summit had basically three main elements. Uh, additional practical support, uh, strength and political support and simplify criteria for membership. When I take this together, I think I can say that the summit brought Ukraine closer to NATO that Ukraine has ever been. So in that sense, that's progress. And then if I break it down very quickly, in terms of practical support, the issue is not just, the issue after the beginning of Russia's war of aggression was how does NATO support uh, Ukraine's, Ukraine's uh, right to self-defense in the short term. But what we did at Vilnius was really extend the support towards, towards the multi, a multi-year framework. And the main point is, how do we work with Ukraine so that we increase inter interoperability, so we support Ukraine in transitioning away from Soviet legacy equipment, standards, doctrines, and training, and make it closer and closer to NATO, fully interoperable. So that's the direction of travel of the military, of the non-lethal military support and assistance to Ukraine. And I think it's very important. It brings them closer to NATO practically. Uh, then we, uh, we started this NATO Ukraine Council, which brings Ukraine closer to NATO politically, because now when the council is held at the NATO headquarters, Ukraine sits as an equal member. It's a 31 plus one format in which Ukraine can not just call the council, but have full involvement as an equal when it sits, uh, when it sits in that NATO Ukraine Council format. And then finally, last but not least, we change 
the way we, we change Ukraine's path towards NATO. Because before Vilnius, the, the expectation was that allies were going to invite Ukraine to develop a membership action plan. And then after this process, Ukraine was going to get uh, an invitation to join the alliance. Essentially, the first criteria has been waived because recognizing that Ukraine is closer to NATO than it has ever been, all the progress and all the military political achievements made in the midst of this tragic war. So the membership action plan is no longer a requirement. So now the next step is really just for the alliance, for the alliance to, to invite Ukraine to join NATO. So it is a matter of when and not if, and it is closer today than it was a year ago. So that's the progress, but then in the rest of the panel I'm happy to discuss What's next? How do we keep this up? Because of course the stakes, as I said, are incredibly high. Thank you. Mr. Marion, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, if I may, on, on NATO, just to mention that we will be hosting the NATO informal ministerial here in Prague next year, which will be part of the anniversaries, of course, and the Czech contribution. But on your previous questions on the elections in the US or elsewhere, I think uh, Putin always hoped for elections, or mm -hmm. Russia always hoped for elections since 2014 and before, be it EU, NATO, member states. Uh, we've managed to maintain solid unity within the EU since 2014, even on the previous sanctions. So let me be a bit optimistic on this uh, also for the future. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Shamsher, after listening to the, the other panelists talk about Ukraine's European future, I'd like to come to you and sort of ask, with that potentially ahead, whether it be five, 10, 15 years, what, is, what practical steps is Ukraine taking in order to prepare itself for membership in NATO and or the EU? How do you see, do you see things changing in Ukraine and uh, if so, how? Actually, that's not the easiest question, but uh, let me before react to what was said uh, concerning Vilnius. So mm -hmm. I would like to uh, keep the positive uh, content and the motion of this panel as much as possible. But I think that, yes, some positive spe steps were taken. But what was lacking, that was the lack of strategic, if you wish, audacity. Because the situation is not a simple one, it's not of evolution, it's really the situation of war, of uh, the signal that might have been sent to Ukrainian people and to Putin. Uh, and I stress again that we are realists. We are not uh, uh, trying to uh, create uh, sandcastles. Uh, as uh, to what we are ready to do. So for, uh, I mentioned that finally uh, uh, we have witnessed in Ukraine a societal change. So the support of EU and NATO membership is overwhelming. It's all uh, depending on the boss. It ranges from 80 to 90 plus. So never been like this. And uh, for, for us, it was really for those who are still vacillating, the big war was uh, the, uh, uh, um, maybe the hour of, of truth, in a way. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, well, there is, uh, there is uh, I would say, uh, uh, there is a desire of the government, of the uh, political class, to uh, move forward, uh, to uh, achieve uh, the reforms. But uh, uh, there is also the, a very strong uh, society, I mean civic society. And it's all that, it's, I would say that it, the, um, the uh, strength uh, and uh, the uh, ability to influence uh, the politics of the civic society is not, in my mind, is not less important than the action of the government. And one of the demands of the civil society is uh, that the government should not be uh, involved in simply checking the boxes, but uh, really implementing the reforms needed for Ukraine, no matter it is uh, the member of the European Union, it is not the member. So there is a wish of the Ukrainian population and there is uh, a readiness to make, if necessary, sacrifices. So, uh, I would say, I see, uh, as I have been in this business for quite long, uh, there was a, uh, at some stage a very romantic uh, understanding and idea about uh, the European Union especially, and also about, to some extent, NATO. Now people understand how much uh, is, to, uh, is to be done, 
but they also were what, how much has been already done, sacrificed by Ukrainian people. So I would say that those uh, sacrifices uh, is the kind of the driver to move forward, not uh, to, to, to ensure that we would live for uh, our children, grandchildren, uh, much better space. And the model I was speaking about is really the model of development. Uh, uh, it's it's a kind of Ukraine we would like to see in future. We are determined to finally do that. Of course, uh, we need for that uh, the support, it understanding, and strategic audacity of our partners uh, in NATO and European Union. Thank you. I, I might ask a sort of a difficult follow-up question. Um, do you sort of see there being a timeline for this, and if that timeline passes, then support for uh, membership in these international organizations might wane. The reason I ask that is because I think about Georgia. Uh, think about Georgia. Um, they had a very pro-European majority, and it seems like as time has gone on, the government has changed. That support might have waned a little bit, and it seems like the window for NATO membership m may be coming to a an end. Is that a worry for you as well? At some stage, uh, I was responsible in the ministry for relationship with the European Union, and I was, it was in uh, the beginning of uh, 2000s. And quite often, I was asked at the time this question. Mm -hmm. And frankly speaking, I've never been fond of uh, uh, identifying any timelines. It's always risky. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, let me uh, frame uh, the answer to your question um, in the following way. So we understand that firstly, and it's absolute necessity, absolute uh, priority to defeat Russia. And we also understand there is no alternative to the radical military defeat of Russia. And we also understand that we can achieve that with the help of our EU and NATO partners. And also in order to achieve that, Ukraine should continue to reform itself because it would make it more efficient on the battlefield. And uh, finally, I would say, it's also the question of uh, the um, uh, Ukraine's reconstruction after the war. It would very much depend which kind of Ukraine would emerge out of the war. And only reformed, determined, and uh, uh, the Ukraine moving steadily towards uh, uh, the full integration into Atlantic and EU uh, community, uh, only this Ukraine would succeed also in uh, um, post-war construction. Finally, I would like to mention that before I, I spoke about uh, romanticism, so people were uh, thinking about EU as a, a kind of uh, the grave wagon, something that would bring goods. But uh, in 2014, I think it was really a kind of the turning point. People uh, associate with EU membership values. So, because the revolution of Maidana dignity was, first of all, it was about values. Thank you. Thank you. Ambassador Freed, I'd like to come to you, um, sort of bringing in the NATO question again. There was a you know, G7 communique that came out of the a parallel meeting from the summit. Um, there's been a lot of discussions about bilateral security guarantees. Why isn't that enough? It's not enough. Maybe use your microphone. It's not enough because anything short of NATO membership, no matter how we express it, will be seen as Putin, by Putin, mm -hmm. as a sign on some level that Ukraine is still up for grabs. That's him. That's the argument that the Poles and the Czechs made to us in the 90s. When they were pushing, when, when Václav Havel and Lech Wałęsa were pushing Bill Clinton for NATO membership, they made that argument. And they were right. The trouble is, the circumstances are much worse for Ukraine now because it's in an actual war. That means it's a lot tougher. What Putin is counting on is for the West to give up, for the Ukrainians to give up, and the Russian argument at that point will be to the Ukrainians, they will never accept you in the West, so you may not like us, but we're the only deal you've got. That's what they will say. And I'm confident that that's what they will say if it, if it reaches that point, because that's what they said to the Poles and the Czechs during the Cold War. 
You see, the West will never accept you. Therefore, we're the best deal you've got. Well, at the end, it turned out that the, that the West was serious about a Europe whole free and at peace. But that issue is what is really at stake. And I will say this. I think the importance of the Vilnius summit was not so much the individual steps it took to move forward. But, though that's true, right? You, you outlined them. You outlined them well. But the fact that now this is being debated again for the first time since 2008. I was at Bucharest. I know what happened. It was a mess. And then we froze, Bucharest, we froze ourselves at Bucharest and we didn't want to, re, to revisit the issue of Ukraine and NATO at all. But we had to in the run-up to Vilnius. So the tiny steps, which from a Ukrainian perspective and many other perspectives were inadequate, actually represented a new beginning for, because now for the first time we're discussing NATO and Ukraine. And that discussion will continue in the run-up to Washington, the Washington summit. The issue remains Ukraine's future, and it's not easy because there's a war on, and, and Putin will continue the war until he can't. And Ukraine has to continue the war because otherwise Putin will, um, Putin is not going to stop. So that's a, that's a dilemma. So that's, I mean, that's my larger answer to your question. So Benedetta, what comes next then? You said that in your, in your opening remarks, you can kind of give us the lay of the land and then you're happy to touch on now what? So touch on the now what? Um, I will, but of course, uh, as, as you know very well, there's a few months between now and the Washington summit, so we are right in the, right in the middle of the discussions on what next. But I think that there's, there's a few things that I think I can say with uh, relative confidence. Uh, firstly, it's that we, will con that we will continue to provide and increase the support that we provide to Ukraine. And I think it's not... Uh, it may seem obvious or banal, but I think it's worth repeating because, of course, if we do not ensure that Ukraine prevails as a sovereign, independent country today, then a lot of these discussions about what comes next are obviously not going to materialize. So we need to keep the transatlantic resolve. We need to keep the transatlantic unity. We need to keep the momentum to support Ukraine. And, uh, I, and I just want to say on this that we are, I am cautiously optimistic that we're really going on the right direction already. Uh, the, the, the issue of, pub, of our public support for Ukraine was mentioned, the fact that it remains largely bipartisan in most of our allies' countries. So I think that's something that we shouldn't take for granted. And part of our work where I sit in Brussels between now and the Washington summit is very much to make sure that that remains the case and that we show up as 31 hopefully 32 allies in Washington and are able to say again with no, with no uh, question that we will continue to support Ukraine as long as it takes for it to prevail as a sovereign independent country. So first of all, it's about retaining and maintaining and strengthening the unity. It's about continuing to step up the support and look more and more about how we can, through the the non-lethal support and through the assistance and the institution building continue to bring Ukraine practically closer to NATO through interoperability work uh, by continuing to, to assist in the reforms. And by the way, I just wanted to echo what was mentioned about the Ukrainians the most important thing about uh, that we need to repeat time and time again when we talk about, uh, about Ukraine, it's, it's uh, incredible will in the midst of this horrific war to continue to push forward for its own democratic future and aspirations. For example, through NATO, we are doing just a tiny sliver of that work through the, uh, the working with the defense sector in the larger building integrity program. And that's very interesting. I always mention that we were expecting to have less requests for assistance for this type of programs in the midst of war, because obviously they have much bigger fish to fry, one would say. And that's not been the case at all. Ukraine has kept pushing for us to do more with them on the, on the democratic control of armed forces, on building integrity, on countering corruption. And I think that's really something that we need to remember. So we're going to continue with that practical support. The discussion about Ukraine's future in NATO is not going to go anywhere. Ukraine's future is in NATO. That has been said time and time again. Now, the, the point is, how do we make that 
political, how do we take tangible steps towards getting from the political level of ambition to the, to the, to the, to the, next, uh, to the next political steps in Washington? And that's, that's very much the work I had. So I'm afraid I cannot tell you exactly how, in what shape or form that will materialize, but I can tell you that it is uh, the NATO Secretary General's firm priority to make sure that that conversation continues so that we get to Washington in the best possible shape we can get. Um. Let me jump in to say, I want to underscore the importance of what Benedetta just said. NATO's, the end state is known. Ukraine in NATO, that's what she said. The question is how we get there and how we build the scaffolding to take us from where we are to where we need to be. That scaffolding through the G7 statements, the, the parallel MOUs, is scaffolding that's made of wood. We need to turn that scaffolding into steel to get us from here to there. Ambassador Shamshur said earlier that Ukraine can't join NATO until the war is on. I wouldn't crystallize that because you don't want to give Putin an incentive to continue the war. I hear what you're saying. But if, in fact, NATO means it, and the Secretary General has been clear that the end state really is Ukraine in NATO, then we can build on that and it gives, I think it can give us a sense of where the Washington summit could end up. And that's not enough to satisfy the Ukrainians completely but that's a lot more than we had a year ago when the Biden administration didn't want to touch the issue. Uh, sure. Yeah. Can I also react to that? Well, actually, when I said that, I didn't, of course, <laughs> meant that we wouldn't like it to happen. It's simply <laughs> what we have been hearing all the time. So we listen very uh, clearly and very attentively to what is being said by our uh, um, friends, our partners, and I hope allies. So that's why it's only to underscore that even if this is not on the table, and speaking frankly, it's not on the table. So I, I think at the very least uh, NATO can do and can uh, should do now is really to put Ukraine on track to uh, membership in, uh, in NATO. Secondly, I, and I wanted, again, maybe I don't want to be a spoiler, but I said it before, and I think that when we look at what has been done by NATO, for example, or by EU, we should be quite frank and direct. We need a clarity of analysis. That's why, no matter how many times we would say that uh, the uh, commitments uh, envisaged by uh, the uh, GSAT statement at the Wilner Summit are security guarantees, they are not. And we should understand that. That's only the framework for assistance, but it's not about, uh, about NATO. And Ambassador, uh, uh, about, it's not about uh, the direct assistance of NATO, for example. And Ambassador Fried was uh, right at the very beginning. The only guarantee is full-fledged membership. So we should not be fooling neither ourselves nor, I would say, the Russians also listen very attentively. And I think uh, in NATO there's also the uh, problem of messaging. Because I, I'll be, again, quite direct and uh, straightforward. Uh, many people in Ukraine uh, uh, looked at the uh, unnecessarily vague formulation at the document of uh, the Vilnius Summit the proof that, of course, maybe there is no more big elephant in the room, but still maybe there is a part of his trunk or tail. So it should be also, I'm speaking quite uh, directly and uh, frankly, that's perception we have and that's uh, perception Ukrainian population has. It's important. Mr. Marion, I wanted to sort of broaden the conversation a little bit for a second before we turn to audience questions. Uh, we have a few already. Um, this is a panel on Ukraine, but this is Central Europe Week, so I want to ask you a question about Central Europe. Has the geopolitical power center of Europe shifted east? 
um, over the last couple of years? Well, uh, yes. I think, I think what we see now, what used to be perceived 10, 15 years ago in Brussels as a kind of maybe hawkish approach, maybe by Czechs, Lithuanians, Poles, it's the new mainstream in the EU as to Russia, as to resilience, as to support to Ukraine, as to Ukraine and Moldova and hopefully Georgian European future, as to disinformation. Remember how difficult it was to, to have the first Stratcom East team within the EAS 2015 after the second Russian aggression started. So I think definitely we, we, we do feel that many partners uh, understands understand us more, talk to us more, and are also interested in our bilateral experience as to Russian influence, as to our assistance to Ukraine. So uh, we even heard uh, this from President Macron at the Globsec speech in Bratislava. So definitely I think uh, the current situation is, for us, this is much more better because we also have not only words as to what we should do about this, but our active involvement in the region. So I think Central Europe is maybe much more visible these days and maybe for the time being we are kicking above our weight. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a few audience questions um, and I, wa I wanna turn to them. So feel free, anyone, to hop in on these. Um, they are, they're pretty general, but I think some of them we haven't touched on yet. One of those that we haven't touched on yet uh, is Ukraine's reconstruction. And the, the specific question is, what is a realistic timeline for reconstruction for Ukraine look like? I guess that would depend. Um, and how does the reconstruction path shape Ukraine's future in Europe? Um, Ambassador Sham, I'm sure I might so come to you. So maybe then... I will start. Uh, so uh, maybe not Ukraine's perception, but at least my perception. So, uh, understandably, uh, speaking about reconstruction, I said already that very much it would depend on how Ukraine would deal with that. So, how reformed and changed the country will be and what be the direction uh, after the war. As I see it now, I am, well, for, for, uh, maybe for exception, I'm optimistic. So, secondly, I think that we should we are will be dealing with the um, the task of enormous proportion. In this sense, it can be compared to the situation in Europe after uh, World War II, a scale to at least uh, to one country. Uh, secondly, it's also important. Uh, I think that uh, this uh, reconstruction uh, wouldn't be the matter only for the government. I, central government. I think that uh, it would be very healthy if as much as possible local government, local communities are involved. It would definitely uh, mean that uh, people uh, would, be, um, would be actually uh, doing what is necessary and getting what's necessary. And I think that is, uh, we, uh, we are looking at a very important driver, that is the membership in the European Union. As soon as we start negotiations, we have this set of things to do, for example, harmonization of uh, our legislation, and to do, I think it would help enormously to do a reconstruction in the right way. Time-wise, still, it is difficult, because we are still at war. We don't know where the war would end, what would uh, be, what, awful things would be invented by Putin again. So in this sense, it, it's really difficult. Now, I think it's also reasonable to start reconstruction, but again, uh, it, now it's extremely difficult. It's, uh, I think it should be, we should be very careful and very choosy what we are uh, going to reconstruct it now because of a continuous threat of Putin, of his uh, missiles and bombs. So it's an enormous task, but uh, we think that uh, we'll manage with your help. Maybe it's hard to say when the reconstruction starts because in a way what we do now is already also part of the reconstruction efforts. Uh, I think civil society is vital and we have great partners in the Ukrainian civil society in the government as well and you do a great job on legislation even in the war time. This is good for the EU integration and also communities, uh, local administration. This is something Czech's been working on for now, uh, Poles and others and this is already happening. But of course many will depend on the broader picture and also maybe on the issues such as assets, Russian assets which is now discussed both among the EU member states and on the EU and G7 level. Mm -hmm. so, 
and maybe I say very shortly about the assets. So uh, everyone was rejoicing when the assets were frozen. But it was an easy part. Now the difficult part is to make them work, and we are still waiting. So maybe in this sense, EU and the United States would be, I would say, uh, more audacious again. So you've been an advocate of using Russian, frozen Russian assets to help with Ukraine's oh, yes. reconstruction. Oh, Talk yes. about that a little bit. Well, um, first, I agree with what's been said. What's needed in Ukraine is not just physical reconstruction, but systemic transformation with, the e with EU membership as the model, working with civil society and local governments. Okay, that's been said, and it's been said well, and it's absolutely right. It's expensive. It costs lots of money. And the Europe and the United States have immobilized uh, more than $300 billion of Russian foreign exchange reserves. The question has come up, why should we ask the American and European taxpayers to fund Ukrainian reconstruction f uh, because of damage that Putin's regime did when we're sitting on Russian money? Now, the counter arguments, uh, well, you will be buried under a mass of arguments from lawyers and financial experts who say, my God, you can't simply take assets. It would ruin the financial, the, the credibility of the European and American financial, uh, led financial system. It's not easy. It's hard. Nevertheless, we are dealing with a war of aggression, war crimes. Uh, Putin started this war for no good reason, and there are various legal, there seem to be, I'm not a lawyer, but there seems to be various legal paths to using that money to help Ukraine. And the politics of this are going to move in the direction of using it. You know, the Congress is debating use, uh, the next assistance package for Ukraine. Well, somebody's going to figure out that we're sitting on, a, the US isn't sitting on much, it's, it's less than $10 billion, but we've got to be able to, to deal with this and not simply regard Regard Russia as the beneficiary of international protections when it has acted to start an illegal and brutal war. So, yeah, I have strong views about this. And I think the Atlantic Council has been pushing a, a, a joint letter or a statement that, that may have come out already, uh, of which I am a signatory. So another, another question from the audience. Um, Ambassador Freed, I might start with you and then if anyone else would like to hop in. Uh, it's about the recent, oh, my, this just fell. it's about the recent interview in The Economist with uh, General Zaluzhny, the top uh, Ukrainian commander, who basically said the war is at a standstill, it's at a stalemate. And without some sort of technological breakthrough, it's going to be that way for quite some time. Um, I thought that when I, when I read the interview, I thought it was interesting because he mentioned Eric Schmidt as someone who was working on, for example, uh, advanced drones that could potentially turn the tide, although that is not supposed to happen anytime soon. This is still some, some ways down the line. Um, but the, the specific question is, you know, based on this interview, isn't it time we stepped up our support for Ukraine? Ambassador Fried, you've not only been um, an advocate for using frozen Russian assets to help Ukrainian reconstruction, but from the beginning, you've been an advocate of sending more advanced weaponry um, to help them get ahead earlier. Um, what do you think about the, this interview and what do you think about the continued weaponry that the United States should be sending for Ukraine? The United States and European countries, the Czech, uh, Czechia included, have done a lot. They, we've sent a lot of weapons to Ukraine. That's a major military logistics operation. And I give full credit to all, to the US government and all the governments involved. It's a big deal. Could we have sent more advanced weapons earlier? Yeah, yeah, I think we could have, I think we should have. As to General Zaluzhny's article, well, to, to his interview, yes, the Ukrainian ground offensive hasn't gotten very far. That's true. On the other hand, Ukraine's strategic attacks have gone from symbolic to strategic. 
the retreat of the Russian Black Sea Fleet from uh, Crimea to Novorossiysk is a big deal and it hasn't been fully appreciated. It's a war. Wars don't go according to plan. We should give Ukraine the weapons it needs to, gain, to do the best it can. And we know of the difficulties on the Ukrainian side, but we must also remember the difficulties on the Russian side. Putin seems to be calculating that his will will outlast ours, and we need to convince him otherwise, and we need to keep sending the weapons to Ukraine. There is a school of thought that's in the United States and in Western Europe that the war cannot be won, therefore we need to push Ukraine into negotiations, which would be a reasonable argument if Putin had any interest in serious negotiations. He doesn't. He has an interest in Ukrainian surrender. And I'm not against, to paraphrase Barack Obama, I'm not against all negotiations, I'm against dumb ones. And it's, uh, it, negotiations are dumb if they proceed from the, prem, from the Russian premises, which is what a lot of the advocates would do. Just to subscribe or say that, I mean, we've been through this before, 2014 with the Minsk agreements, but if we do the same, we will just get maybe some time, or Russia will get some time, and this will not happen. So I think we should have learned from our previous mistakes, and you're fully, fully right, Ambassador. So let's do more of the same. Support to Ukraine, sanctions, homeworks, resilience. Oh, and just to give a shout out to the administration, last week it issued a new set of sanctions which went after sanctions evaders. It was a serious list. A lot of work went into it. And as a person who designed the initial helped design the initial sanctions against Russia after 2014, I appreciated the effort. So there is more we can do, and we're doing. Um, no, just wanted to chime in with two two quick points. One is to completely uh, agree on the on the issue of negotiations, ceasefires, pauses, anything that does not recognize that the Russian regime is not change its maximus list objectives since the beginning of the war. We have not seen any indication that they are, have changed their intentions. Certainly their behavior in terms of mobilization, in terms of turning their economy into a war economy, in terms of industrial production, in terms of closer strategic alignment with Iran, in terms of uh, rela growing relationship with North Korea, everything indicates that this is a regime that it's, if anything, hardening its position and therefore uh, calls, for, calls for dumb negotiations, to paraphrase Ambassador Fried, I would, I would, I just find myself in complete agreement with that. But then I also wanted to say another um, a short point about the, the, the Economist article and the broader discussion about where the counter-offensive offensive is going. I'm not going to give a military analysis, but just a very small uh, policy point, and that is that I think we really need to do a good job to talk to our population and prepare them for what is the reality of an attrition warfare, which is difficult, which is grinding, in which each meter that the Ukrainians are able to take back from the Russians, and they are able to do this even now, even after Russia has basically spent month building for fortification, trenches, uh, uh, an entire system that reminds you of World War I, and still there are painful and slow gains. So I think we need to be able to tell that story to our population and also remind ourselves that when Putin started its war of aggression in February 2022, many of us thought that Ukraine would fold within two weeks. Let's not forget that. And here we are, they're still fighting, they're still taking back territory, and yes, it's absolutely excruciatingly hard to do so. This counteroffensive is uh, not an easy uh, enterprise by no means, but that's why we need to continue to support Ukraine, and if anything, the time to increase our support in terms of military assistance, I would say it's really now. But I think it's very important that we tell our population, yes, the gains are slow, but it couldn't have been otherwise. Anybody was expecting a magic want a magic victory. That's not the way war, war works, unfortunately. And so we need to keep our strategic resilience and patience and continue to support them, I think. Just to add, uh, we've been speaking a lot, unfortunately, about uh, Mr. Putin here, but this is not only about himself. I mean, the system here, if you look at the Russian system and the groups now, and the level of uh, 
propaganda even the young generation has been facing. Let's not hope that with or without Putin this might change. This is not only about Putin himself. So maybe it would be unnatural for me not to say uh, something. So, but uh, on the other hand, it's really it was rewarding to hear other speakers. So it seems to be consensus. Well, firstly, I think that any discussion, uh, more aid, less aid, uh, 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 the, about the uh, counteroffensive actually is somehow mitigates the fact that uh, Ukraine is fighting not only for itself, it's also fighting for democracy in Europe and globally. So everyone is interested for, uh, for Ukraine to prevail. Secondly, I think it's again, it should be remembered there is no alternative to the radical uh, defeat of Putin. Yes, it's a very difficult tragic war for every Ukrainian. Still, we are doing our the best. And uh, uh, we had the discussion a couple of days ago. I think that now three things should be really done. So the firstly, the, uh, the arms to Ukraine, more sophisticated, more uh, performing, because we cannot compete with Russia in human resources. The only way to compete with Russia is to compete in the quality, not speaking about the motivation of our uh, soldiers. Second, the sanctions, not simply screwing, uh, uh, sc uh, adding uh, some uh, effort to the screws, but also to elimin eliminating loopholes, uh, this uh, convention of the sanction. And thirdly, what is really very important, uh, speaking uh, to the population. Uh, the, uh, the Biden's uh, uh, speech was the right one, but a bit too late. He needs to speak more, and people in all European countries should be addressing population. That would uh, actually be an important factor to uh, continue the flow of the aid uh, to Ukraine, which is absolutely necessary, and I think that any discussion, uh, in, uh, whether it is in the interest of others, Yes, it's in, in the interest of the world, of the um, democratic world, and especially if you look how to coordinate, how uh, act together uh, the countries who form the axis of evil. Did you want to have? And it's also you? important to reach out to other partners so that they understand that this is not just a regional conflict in Europe, but this has global impacts in food security, trade links, etc. And this is what Ukraine has been doing with the President Zelensky peace formula, our peace plan, and the International Crimean Platform, which is really important, and we fully support this. I want to ask uh, Ambassador Freed, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second, and I'm going to ask you sort of a spicy question. Um, because this is what panels are for. You mentioned Russia's maximalist aims. Um, I, it seems like some of the uh, conversations that you have in Europe and the US are a little bit maximalist themselves, where anything less than Ukraine, uh, Crimea, anything less than Crimea, and anything less than restoring Ukraine back to its pre-2014 um, lines uh, is a failure. What do you say to that? I mean, people have been writing about this for a couple years now, have been pushing for a negotiation, even if it's not something that Putin would be interested in. Um, they've been arguing for, uh, you know, what is realistic here? What do you, what are, what are your answers to, to those types of arguments? I believe in being realistic. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in elevating realism to a doctrine because that usually means that somebody comfortable in the West wants to dispose of somebody else's territory and lives. We've seen a lot of that. That's my problem with doctrinal realism. We don't know how the war is going to end. But we do know what won't happen. It won't, there won't be a Russian victory parade down the Khrushchev. That's not going to happen. The bracket of possible outcomes has shifted in a favorable direction thanks to Ukrainian resistance. As I said, I'm not against all negotiations, I'm just against dumb ones. And it would be, as, a, as an old practitioner, the idea that we go out to the Russians and say, okay, let's do a deal would work is fanciful. We've seen that. They would say that we would throw a bouquet at their feet and they would spurn it and we'd throw another bigger bouquet. And pretty soon we'd be 
desperately giving away everything while they answered no. This is a Russian negotiating style. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. If the Russians are interested in a serious negotiation, they actually ha know how to negotiate very practically and very, very capably. Well, they're, exactly, they're, they're, they're not at that point yet. They might be, but to push the Ukrainians into a position of supplicant is almost to guarantee that Putin will demand more and more. I mean, didn't we chase after, uh, La didn't John, Secretary of State John Kerry chase after Lavrov about Syria? Mm. I mean, so there were those of us who were watching it going, oh, no, please, God, restrain yourself. Not because John Kerry didn't want to do the right thing, he did want to do the right thing, but Lavrov had absolutely no interest. And that is a very Russian and Soviet style negotiating posture. I don't know how the battlefield will end. It is, it is difficult, it is harder to imagine a sustainable peace with Crimea in Russia's hands. Mm -hmm. Just look at the geography. It doesn't matter what I think. The war will end as it ends, and the Ukrainians are not actually idiots. They will make strategic decisions and we have to respect that. So that is, that's not a definitive now and for all times answer, but don't be in such a damned hurry to give away somebody else's territory, okay? I mean, we're in Prague for God's sakes. You know, really? I mean, no. There are some lessons which Americans have learned, and I will say this, Joe Biden is of an age that he remembers this, these lessons uh, in his bones. He's got it. Yeah. So maybe uh, I would corroborate what uh, Dan has said uh, from the Ukrainian point of view. Well, uh, well, basically, the Ukrainian public opinion is overwhelmingly for uh, uh, total restoration of territorial integrity, including Crimea, and fighting on it's. But it should be understood: it's not that we want more Ukrainians to die. We, but it's we understand that the situation is either or. We should win, or the uh, consequences might be devastating for Ukraine, but they would be also devastating for Europe. Uh, for uh, the transatlantic community. That's why we are determined to, to, uh, um, uh, to fight until the total radical defeat of Putin. And we do understand that we cannot negotiate with Putin. And I would say that we cannot negotiate even more general with Russia. Uh, you remember Bismarck about uh, the value of the uh, agreements uh, uh, um, concluded with Russia, not worth even the paper they are written on. Uh, oh, uh, that's actually, dates back to the 19th century. It hasn't changed. And we do understand that the purpose of Putin and his aim remains unchanged. The annihilation of the Ukrainian states and killing Ukra as ma many Ukrainians as possible. He is quite open about that. So we cannot give him this chance. So we'll be fighting on and we do, and he, hearing you, I'm, I would say, again, feeling optimistic, we, we can do that only together. Ukraine and the free world, transatlantic community and European community. Thank you. Was, we have to wrap in just a second, but I also want to give um, uh, Dr. Berti and Mr. Marion a chance to offer closing thoughts if you have them. Um, not to put any pressure on you, but I wanted... 20, 20 okay. seconds, maybe? Sure, of course. Well, no, just, just as a segue, because I think that there's we've covered so much ground, but if I had to you know, take away a few lessons to bring back with me to Brussels uh, as, I leave, uh, as I leave Prague, I would say one, one of them is we really need to uh, operationalize this this 
uh, site invented this strategic awakening that we talk so much about and part of it a very simple one is we could start taking some of our potential adversaries and competitors seriously when they tell us exactly what they want to do when they tell us exactly what they wish to do whether it's to wipe a country off a map whether it's to reclaim sphere of influence whether it's to change the status quo in Taiwan we should just listen and take them seriously and prepare accordingly and I think that's a very simple lesson that in this part of Europe we get that we get reminded about from this part of Europe time and time again and uh, I just want to take it back with me to Brussels and just if we just do that it's already half of the we're half of the half of the, half of the solution is implemented just listen to them when they tell us exactly what they will do if we don't act well, that's, a, I think, an optimistic and strong point to end on. So uh, Ambassador Shamsher, Dr. Berti, Minister Marion, Ambassador Freed, thank you so much for your insights. This was a fantastic panel. Um, so what's happening next, uh, for those people watching online, there's going to be about a 30-second pause, so don't panic if the uh, video goes blank, uh, because we're going to reset the stage here for a spotlight conversation uh, between Ambassador Freed um, and His Excellency Martin Dvorak, who is the Minister for uh, European Affairs here uh, in the Czech Republic. So we'll go ahead and uh, get that set up. And again, thanks to all of you. This was a wonderful conversation to kick off Central Europe Week. And thanks to the audience. Well, good afternoon to everybody online and welcome again to Central Europe Week brought to you by the Atlantic Council in cooperation with Europeum and the US Embassy in Prague. This is a week of discussions in, Bratis in Prague, Bratislava and Warsaw where we dive into the issues that are consuming the Central Europeans and the Americans uh, the war, Russia's war against Ukraine and the, and the West's response and what it means. There is no better place to start this discussion than Prague. Czechia, Thank you. Czechia is one of the co-authors of a Europe whole, free and at peace. That struggle is continuing. The war in Ukraine is about whether a Europe whole free and at peace extends to Ukraine or not.
Putin says it does not and will not, that Ukraine belongs to Russia. The Ukrainians believe that Ukraine belongs to them, the Ukrainians. And they see a future in Europe for themselves. That is, a, that is their choice. They made that clear in 2014. That is a choice that Czechs and Slovaks and Poles and Lithuanians, Estonians, Latvians, and many others in this part of the world made for themselves. But they made it under better conditions when Russia was more benign and less violent. But Russia is what it is. Minister, you are responsible for Czechia's relations with the European Union. And first, it's just great that there is, that Czechia gets to have relations with the European Union as a European Union member. This would have looked like a satirical Czech dissident, you know, <laughs> pamphlet back in the 1980s. Right? It would have been seen as fantastic, yeah, right. impossible, and yet the impossible becomes every day. Yeah. I wanted to ask you to give us your thoughts about Ukraine and the European Union because that is a huge and difficult issue. It's one thing to think about it and talk about it in theory. It's another thing to do it in practice. The Americans, uh, we have a role in NATO, <laughs> and we're struggling with the NATO-Ukraine relationship. I mean, clearly, there's no sure. sense my denying it. We're wrestling with that. But talk about the EU and Ukraine and how it looks. Um, I know that's a big, broad topic, but it's, it's a central one. Yeah, you're right. Okay. First of all, Ambassador, I have to say I'm really absolutely honored and, and pleased to have this opportunity to be with you together on the panel because you used to be my idol for decades and I'm observing your career and I'm listening and reading your articles. So really, it's, it's a huge, huge honor for me. Uh, you are right. Uh, 20, 40 years ago, no one in Czechia would be able, in Czechoslovakia then, could imagine that once we will be members of European Union and we will be important member, we will be one of those who are really leading some, some projects or, or perspectives, especially in Ukraine. And of course it has some historical consequences because we, as you mentioned also, Poles and Slovaks and others, we do have our own experience with Russia and we know, we know what Russian occupation means and Russia is able to do to the neighbors. So that's why we understand. Also that's why we understand Ukraine, Ukrainians' ambition to be a member of NATO and the European Union because they, as well as us, they thought and they are sure that being members of those groups or, or entities uh, should be the best protection against Russian imperial imperial activities or moods. And that's why we started to support Ukraine immediately after after the February 22nd. And I am sure that by very beginning there were many, many statesmen, politicians, business people in Western Europe, they were not very happy with our movement, with our attitude and also with uh, Zelensky's message. Because I remember a game changer for 21st century, maybe even President Zelensky said, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. <laughs> and I think it was a huge change because many people for sure expected in Europe that there will be really just a three days or one week going some short battle or short episode and then everything will be like it used to be before business as usual and Germans and French and Belgian and uh, Netherlands business people will make the same business with Russia as used to be. Zelensky will be somewhere in exile and uh, everything will be, there will be some new puppet government in Kiev. It didn't happen. And I believe that Eastern members of EU and NATO were the, the leaders of this opinion changing moment because as I said we had some experience and we knew and also we had some psychological advantage maybe because now in the moment we were in the position look 
We were saying it. You didn't believe that. <laughs> now you see. We were right and you were wrong, so we have to do something. What I have to say now is that, of course, after more than 600 days of occupation or the battle or invasion, however you call it, everyone is getting tired, including Ukrainians, including us, including Americans, everyone. So now I think is the most complicated moment in the short history of Russian aggression against Ukraine, because so far all of us, we were very enthusiastic, ready to help, ready to support as much as possible. Now I'm afraid that the enthusiasm is now a little bit eroding and we cannot afford to give up, <laughs> of course. Uh, regarding the membership of EU in Ukraine, in Ukraine EU, uh, you know that the accession talks are, might be, beginning by end of this year or beginning of next year. We are waiting for the report made by European Commission. It should be presented day after tomorrow, 8th of November. Yeah. We had some indication from this summer when there was some pre-report uh, pre <laughs> presented by, by a European Com Com Commission. And nobody can say at the moment whether it will be very optimistic, optimistic or less optimistic. Very likely it will be not pessimistic, if we cannot afford to be pessimistic. And uh, I, I can't say at the moment what might be the recommendation or result of this, uh, of this uh, document, because I had some rumors from one side, they are not able to fulfill all the condition, and from second side, they are very good working and they will get it. So don't ask me at the moment <laughs> what is going to happen. Of course, my wish is uh, that Ukraine will start the accession talks uh, immediately or as soon as possible. On the other hand, I can imagine that we will just send some kind of positive message. You are on the right track, do more, a little bit more, and you will be in. So this is something what could happen, and I believe it. We cannot forget that also we are not speaking about only about Ukraine, also about Moldova, maybe Georgia, for sure about Western Balkans, and it is some kind of competition between them, uh, among them. And uh, I remember uh, Albanian prime minister saying, tell me who should attack my country to have a better access to European Union. <laughs> he is joking, of course, but. I believe that this is a perspective from Western Balkan. They are saying, look, we are working on this uh, for, for several years and we are not, still not adapted. And now uh, Ukraine, just because she's un uh, Ukraine, it's under, under pressure, under attack, they are having some advantage. And what is important and what I'd like to stress is that we cannot afford to make some political decision without real fulfillment of the conditions they are given to uh, entering. There's a lot in what you said. <laughs> Sorry, it was too long. That's okay. Um, first, you pointed out accurately that Czechia, Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia were right about Russia, <laughs> and Germany and France were wrong. My own country was hopeful as late as the Biden administration's first year that we could have a stable and predictable relationship with Russia. So let us say that it, as an American, it's not my place to point fingers at the Germans and French, but we have all moved. The Germans now say that European security has to be organized not with Russia, but against Russia. That's German. It's a huge change. It's a big deal. And M President Macron's speech in Bratislava at the GlobeSec conference mm -hmm. was a big deal. We, we have to give credit to the countries, to those governments who have had a major awakening. Exactly. You're also right that Ukrainian <clears throat> EU membership is not simple. <laughs> France has been protective of its farmers and the common agricultural <laughs> policy has been an issue sure. for them. The Poles, as we have seen, are protective of their farmers. And assuming there's a new government in Poland, which probably will be, the new government is going to be equally protective of their farmers. The peasant Polish Peasant Party is going yeah. to be part of that government. Yeah. So, 
Those are not simple issues. Definitely not. And Ukraine is a big country. As you read the European Union, are the member states, is the commission ready to go from theory to practice and take negotiations seriously? And the other, if I can be not cynical, but sort of you know, reflective, I guess, Negotiations with Turkey have been going on for some time, but nobody, but few take them seriously. Few believe that Turkey's actually going to become an EU member. And my government pushed, we wanted it. I mean, we still do. Can Ukraine, will EU-Ukraine negotiations be serious? It does the, the Ukrainians are gonna mean it, assuming they can do their part and they have a lot to do, I get it. Will the EU? Let me hope, yes. Yeah. Uh, I can be absolutely 100% sure that everyone who is now verbally supporting Ukraine, it's meaning it. Uh, might be that maybe I just understand that there is no time for refusing it right now. Uh, you mentioned several complications or issues they could complicate the, the entering. Uh, so I go, I go, but as I said, we, we cannot afford to leave uh, Ukraine alone. We have to show them they are on the right way. On the other hand, we cannot afford also not to ask for full 100% fulfillment of, of conditions. What is now on the table in European Union is that the discussion whether we are ready as EU to adopt Ukraine right. as a member. Right. You said it's a huge country, 40 million of people under pressure, under war, in war. So what I'd like to stress is Ukrainians right now are showing every day their devotion to main values and principles like democracy, freedom, independence, respect to the human rights. They are dying and starving for it, and we have to respect it. On the other hand, I'm not really sure whether they are already ready to fulfill also the condition for rule of law, anti-corruption, de-oligarchization, oligarchization, right. you know. Right, right, right. yeah. <laughs> Sorry for it. Judicial reform, etc., etc. And first of all, they are still in the war. And the country which doesn't have a control over all the land or the soil cannot, cannot enter because they, are, they, they don't control the country. And of course, the, the war is having a, a very strong and heavy economic consequences. So for sure, Ukraine at the moment is not able to deliver in all the aspects in the economic area. So one side is they are showing more devotion to the values than us at the moment. On the other hand, they are technically not ready yet for full membership, but I believe they are ready for starting of accession talks. And Let's hope that the ongoing debate about changes, potential changes in inst institutional uh, services or, or functions within EU, like voting, QMB, it's a very crucial issue. Um, I mean, qualified majority voting instead yep, of, yep. of, uh, of uh, consensus. What will be definitely brutally misused by populist countries in every country populist leaders by every country. Yeah. You are losing your national sovereignty. You are losing the inter national interest without being defined what is a national interest. So this is something what would be definitely a very strong political battle and it will be not easy to, to win it. But as you ask me, what do you think about it? I just have to answer. I really believe that all of us, we understand how important it is to keep Ukraine on our side and not to let them die or let them fall down. That's well put. I am familiar with what you're talking about. I'm familiar with the argument that somehow Brussels is going to take away our national soul. I mean, Viktor Orban says that <laughs> explicitly. But of course, he's cozying up, he's cozying up to Putin. It's a serious issue. Is. I understand that. And the EU is going to have to take tough steps, and it will not be easy. And the Ukrainians will have to take tough steps, and that will not be easy. I know we're at an end, 
but I want to offer the following. Everything that, the Czech, that Czechia did and that Poland did was considered impossible. There were many people in the United States who believed that Charter 77 was ridiculous, that solidarity <laughs> was either inconsequential or dangerous <laughs> because it was, a, the leaders of those movements were attempting to, to have their people dream impossible dreams. There was great cynicism and of course you know what happened. Charter 77 succeeded. Solidarity won an election. The Baltics, you know, communism fell. The Baltics regained their independence. The Soviet Union fell. It went from impossible to inevitable and now young people in Prague take it for granted. My point is that what seems impossible can sometimes happen under certain circumstances. The Ukrainians had 20 years of independence where they basically didn't know where they wanted to be, but they know it now. And at some point, they will, my guess is that Ukrainian society will say, we didn't fight and die for our independence to go back to what was before. We want Europe and we need to be ready. So I think that's possible. And every time I come to Prague or Warsaw, I remember what it looked like in the beginning and what you did with a generation of freedom and security. Look what you did. It's a miracle. Only it became reality. So that is where I start. Absolutely. I agree with you and I am uh, in the same optimistic position as you are. And what I really believe in is that Ukrainians will never ever give up. They will fight until the last drop of blood, until the last man is able to keep the gun. What I'm a little bit afraid is about our mood to support them. I mean us, Western. Right. Not, right. not myself. <laughs> so this is something what we have to understand. Ukrainians will fight until and whatever it is. We cannot afford to let them fall down. We have to support them. On the other hand, business is asking for more business, less war. And this is something what the politicians, even statesmen, has to reflect, have to, has, have to understand. There will be a pressure, stop it. We need to make a business. Sanctions are not working, are not bringing us enough. So this is something what I'm a little bit afraid. I'm very optimistic regarding the Ukrainians' mood to fight until end, until victory, I believe. What I'm not that <laughs> sure is how long our Westerners are able to support them as we did so far. Well, I remember what Madeleine Albright always used to say. I'm an optimist who worries a lot. <laughs> and we all have our political challenges, including or maybe especially in the United States. But I'll end on this note. We should look at the Ukrainians because they believe in our values more than we ourselves do sometimes. Yep. And we should take inspiration from that. Right. They believe in us. Absolutely. And we should believe in ourselves. May I have also a question on you as an American? Sure. Do you expect any changes in American position after American presidential election? Oh, God. What a question. <laughs> but fair enough. Look, we're, it's because, a big... Sorry, sorry. I think it is a very crucial moment in the future of Ukraine. Look, you're right. Okay? And there is a fight in America between our two foreign policy traditions. The Isolation. one of the internationalism and American leadership in the world, which has been going on for over a hundred years and put into practice by Harry, let's say Harry Truman, <laughs> yeah. right? Extended by Reagan. And another tradition, which is Isolation. America first. The last time the America first crowd had great power. Well, no need to tell a, a check what happened. <laughs> right? We, were, we pulled out of European security, the, the result was disaster. I think the internationalists will win the political fight, but there is a, a fight to be sure. And yeah, we should, take, we should take inspiration from the Ukrainians. So Minister, that is a great note to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see you. It was my real pleasure and honor to meet you and to discuss with you about something what I really have deeply in my heart because I spent some time in Ukraine and I still believe that 
Sláva Ukrajině. Grojem slava. Thank you.